Welcome to History Comes Alive, the podcast that takes you on a deep dive into a new historical topic every episode. Join us as we explore the nuances of historical events you probably didn't learn about in school. Here's your host, Jeff Nichols. Welcome back. For those of you who listen every week when the episodes drop on Friday, I apologize for missing last week. It's been a crazy month, so thanks for coming back. Now, as you'll recall, we've been looking at the life and service of John Underhill. He's the second in a small group of guys that we're developing kind of small, short, mini biographies for as a lead up to the Pequot War. There were a lot of guys involved back then that we don't hear a lot about in the popular history books that really were quite important. John Underhill was a very seasoned and well-rounded character within the colonial regions of both Puritan New England and also, as we'll continue today, the Dutch New Netherland. Now, just a quick review. He had taken an unusual road to get to the New World. You remember he had come from a family of dissidents living in the Netherlands among the Puritans. The difference was that his family had ended up in the Netherlands because of political reasons and not religious. At any rate, it was this time in the Netherlands that had prepared him for his life in the New World. And we say New World because he was all over the northern English colonies and New Netherland for years. He was not confined to just one area. He'd been an effective militia commander and administrator. His problems emerged through an adulterous affair and being on the wrong side of the antinomian controversy. He had proven to be a brutal military leader. Brutal, but effective. He also took on many administrative roles, which tended to bore him. Ultimately, John Underhill sought an assignment with the Dutch of New Netherland when they began to have real problems with the local natives. And we'll look first at his military service, this time, and then the next time we're together, his administrative service to the Dutch. And we'll discover that he caused as much trouble in New Netherland as he had in Massachusetts Bay. Last time we talked about this escalating saga, we spent quite a bit of time developing the native landscape in what is today's eastern New York state. So in a nutshell, it's kind of like a sandwich. I know we used a clock face the last time. But the Mohawk and the Mohegan were north of New Amsterdam toward Albany. That would be our top piece of bread. And the Dutch and the Delaware natives were concentrated in the New Amsterdam, New York City, Long Island area. That's kind of like the peanut butter and jelly. And the Susquehannock were to the south in Pennsylvania. And they're kind of like that bottom piece of bread on that peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And there were various other smaller tribes and bands scattered throughout the region as well. And we concluded our time with the opening volleys of what would become Keefe's War. If you remember, there was a group of Wappinger natives that had fled the Mohicans looking to the Dutch for protection. Governor Keefe, against the Council of the Twelve Men, ordered their massacre. And this touched off two years of violence. The massacre so enraged the local natives that they, in essence, banded together against the Dutch. It came out to about 1,500 warriors to 250 Dutchmen. This was the environment that attracted the bored and ambitious John Underhill to New Netherland. I mean, to be honest, I'm not sure why it took him this long to migrate this way. The magistrates in Massachusetts Bay certainly had no more use for him, and he would have been quite comfortable among the Dutch. To further develop the situation, I do want to start where we left off, at the massacre, the touch point for so much bloodshed to come. Governor Keith was not without his detractors. And one of those men was an accomplished Dutchman named David Peterson de Vries. He was not just one of the 12 men. He was the chairman. He was one of the guys who had been actively promoting peace with the natives. He had property and interests in the colony. He bore witness to the Wappinger Massacre. And it's remembered as the Pavonia Massacre of 1643. And I have two quotes from de Vries. I will say one of these is attributed to a later massacre. Later meaning after de Vries had left the colony, but it's still attributed to him. And so with either one of these massacres, he must have said it. I'm assuming it's the first one, the Wappinger Massacre. The second quote is a standalone that appears to be legitimate and both lends and gains credence through the first quote. 
At any rate, I want to be careful not to report any incorrect information on such a damning action, but I also don't want to avoid the ugly because it's not popular. There were a lot of atrocities on all sides during these years. What we do want to remember is that the Dutch, well, all the Europeans, were new on the scene. It was their arrival that had touched off so much unrest and disunity among the natives. History has no short supply of recorded atrocities. These are just two more to add to that storyline. But listen to these reports. David DeVries wrote a lot about the natives of his region. He wrote of their looks, their complexions, their dress. And here is what David Peterson DeVries recorded about Pavonia. Now, this does get a little graphic. So it's not as bad as some of the quotes that we might have in future episodes. But if you have little ones or if you're of a weaker constitution, feel free to skip ahead just a little bit. We'll give you a few seconds to do that. I feel these atrocities are important to listen to. It's easy to avoid them, but it does not do the victims justice, nor does it help the contemporary culture that we live in really understand exactly what happened way back then. So David DeVries said this, quote, infants were torn from their mother's breasts and hacked to pieces in the presence of their parents and pieces thrown into the fire and the water and other sucklings being bound to small boards were cut, stuck, and pierced and miserably massacred in a manner to move a heart of stone. Some were thrown into the river, and when the fathers and mothers endeavored to save them, the soldiers would not let them come on land, but made both parents and children drowned. End quote. Imagine those scenes. Imagine the horror of the parents. Imagine the horror of the onlookers. What must that have been like? Another lengthier observance says this, quote, when the Indian prisoners had been kept a long time in the corps de garde. The director became tired of giving them food any longer, and they were delivered to the soldiers to do with as they pleased. The poor, unfortunate prisoners were immediately dragged out of the guardhouse and soon dispatched with knives from 18 to 20 inches long, which Director Kieft had made for his soldiers for such purposes, saying that swords were for use in the huts of the savages when they went to surprise them. But these knives were much handier for boweling them. That's right, boweling them. The report continued. The soldiers then cut strips for the other's body, beginning at the calves, up the back, over the shoulders, and down the knees. And Governor Keefe was quite amused. He then ordered him to be taken out of the fort. And the soldiers bringing him, forcing him to dance the entire time, threw him down, cut off his genitals, thrust them in his mouth while still alive, and at last placing him on a millstone, cut off his head, end quote. That's awful. There were reportedly over 20 native women present at this scene that yelled and howled and whooped and said that they had never seen such atrocities among their own people. Now, I've read a lot of accounts of atrocities. And again, this is just one of many, many instances. But that doesn't diminish the graphic, horrific nature of what happened. Imagine the scene. This guy had a sense of self-worth and belonging, like we all do. He had presumably a family. He'd already been displaced by the aggression of the Mohicans. He had sought refuge among the Dutch. I mean, that was his crime, a vulnerable human being, a man with testosterone and pride and dignity. Yet look how others treated him. Again, I've commented on this before. I mean, it's not surprising, these types of situations when they come up. It could have been young men serving in the Dutch military at this point. I mean, they're far away from the observation of civilized society. There's no social consequences to fear. Their own testosterone coursing through their veins. What does that image do to you, though? Imagine if you were abused in such a way. Not the pain of it. The indignity of it, the baseness of it, the inhumanity up close and personal. What do you think about in those times? I mean, do you think at all? I mean, at some point, does your mind just turn off? What do you think initially? And how numb do you get? Do you actually escape the situation through your thoughts? Are you delirious? Do you still feel pain or humiliation at some point? I mean, by the end of the year, 1643, a very disgusted David Peterson DeVries was back in Holland 
writing a book of his experiences and leading the charge to have director Keefe recalled, which he was. But the damage was done. This is the more detailed account of the Pavonia massacre that goes a long way toward understanding how the various tribes, or rather why the various tribes, rallied around their common enemy. It's understandable. I think the smaller tribes and the weaker peoples began to realize the true threat that the Dutch and probably all Europeans represented just about this time. The big guys like the Mohawk and the Susquehannock, they still had enough power of their own. Into this mix came John Underhill. At this point, as I think about it, what kind of a man was he? This was the environment that he willingly entered into. I mean, was he just crazy? Was he just like a xenophobe? Was he pro-European? Was he anti-native? Was he a religious zealot like some people have charged? I mean, I don't think that necessarily in that sense because he wasn't a Puritan. He might've lived among them. He wasn't a Puritan. And he was on the wrong side of the antinomian controversy, the side that believed in religious tolerance, at least of some sort. Later, we'll see that he has more issues with the ideas of religious freedom and tolerance among the Dutch. But for now, let's get back to our place in the narrative. His military activity for the Dutch. It is noteworthy to point out that almost every society that survives and expands has their John Underhills, men who do the dirty work. We don't like to acknowledge it. We like to look the other way. We like to live in a, you know, a pristine world where we can deny these things. But it's true. I don't know if certain men are just born to fight. They fight whoever is not on their side without fear or trepidation. I mean, they're the vigilante type, the, the mercenary for hire, the guys with like seemingly zero compassion or empathy. There's going to be a lot of these guys along the way, just like John Underhill. And the situation did not get any better for the natives of the New Netherland region once Underhill arrived. I'm guessing his reputation preceded him. If it didn't, it was sure to catch up very soon. 1644 was a busy year. There were two massacres that we want to talk about today. In February, there was an incident most probably at a site identified as Pound Ridge, Westchester County, New York State. Underhill, working for the Dutch, attacked a winter village of the Silwanoi and the Wetchquosgeek. I'm sorry if I mispronounced that. Some of these words are a little tricky for me. The Silwanoi and the Wetchquosgeek, groups of the Wappinger Confederacy. It's estimated that between five and 700 natives lost their lives. So picture this scene. The journey to the village had been hard. The expedition had left for the attack in the midst of a snowstorm. It was so bad that some of the men had to actually crawl at times. And they arrived in the evening and rested for a couple of hours. I mean, imagine their mood at this point. You're cold, you're maybe you're wet, especially your feet. I hate cold, wet feet. You're tired, maybe they're hungry, itching for a fight. I mean, they knew who was leading them. Now, the village itself was in the middle of a celebration and was entertaining guests from other tribes. So the atmosphere must have been festive. They had no idea this attack was coming. I mean, how's your mood at a big party? How observant are you? The moon was full and the natives were awake. I'm not sure if the drowsiness of slumber would act almost like an anesthesia for such a violent surprise as they were about to have. It's probably something I'll actually never know. The houses in the village were positioned in neat little rows. And when the attack started, it's reported that about 180 natives died outside the houses. So I picture a busy little village type setting, like one of those quaint little holiday scenes from a, a Lifetime for Women uh, seasonal movie or something like that. So roughly 180 natives died when the attack started and only one Dutch soldier. So reminiscent of Mystic, remember we talked about that a few episodes ago, the Mystic Massacre. Reminiscent of Mystic, where the same type of attack had successfully wiped out a large portion of the Pequot nation years earlier, the village was surrounded to the effect that the natives could not escape. Imagine the fear. I mean, we see these types of images all the time in the news these days of, of senseless, unexpected attacks where just a few people are killed. I mean, like that minimizes the horror, right? So the natives, in a sudden fight for their lives, did what they could. They fired arrows at their attackers from inside the houses. 
I mean, it might have been a full moon, but you're still shooting arrows into the dark on a, on a snowy landscape. I wonder how effective that was. But it's all they had. At this point, the village was set on fire. And when it was over, only eight natives had survived. There were many women, children, and older folks here. Imagine the fear for these parents. You're entertaining guests and showing your kids a good time. The joy and laughter suddenly stops. Well, it stops like a wave moving through the crowd as reality sets in. It's believed that there were at least seven tribes represented in the massacre. Most of the dead had been burned alive. I think I'd have made a run for it. I mean, anyway, you wouldn't have had anything to lose. But this is an attempt to make light of the tragedy. It's also noteworthy that like so many of the regional natives, these folks were no threat to the Europeans. They wanted peace. They had agreements with the local officials for a peaceful coexistence. One account attributed to Underhill himself says that he was amazed that as the fires raged, he said, quote, what was most wonderful is that among this vast collection of men, women, and children, not one was heard to cry or scream, end quote. What was most wonderful is that among this vast collection of men, women, and children, not one was heard to cry or scream. Take a look at the culture we live in today. We cry and scream about everything. If we don't get our coffee fast enough, if the coffee's too hot, if someone gives us a dirty look, we're offended by words. These people burn to death without crying or screaming. That should disturb you. It disturbs me. It disturbs me that, that John Underhill thought that was wonderful. Imagine being in the native cleanup crew. I mean, the charred bodies of family and friends, the sorrow and the confusion as to why this had happened, the anger with nowhere to focus it, no justice. Like the Pequots must have felt all that time ago. Remember, the men had been away. Mystic was filled with mostly women and children and old folks, all burned alive as well. No less terrible than modern terrorism, is it? When the soldiers returned from the assignment to New Amsterdam, there was a, quote, Thanksgiving celebration. Of the 130 men serving under Underhill, there was only one casualty and about 15 wounded. I mean, I guess that's because they attacked a friendly group in the midst of a celebration at night, just like Mystic. That's real manly, isn't it? Again, who had more dignity here? I know I've asked this question before, but when it comes to war or the art of war, or doing war, participating in war. Do you believe in total war? Should there be some measure of empathy, sympathy, mercy extended to the enemy? I mean, is this how you conduct war? Is this war at all? The thing is, the organization and the perpetuation of society gets ugly. This battle owns the unfortunate honor also of having the most casualties of any in the entirety of Keefe's war. It also brought several groups to their knees. They sued for peace and were done. Remember, this whole thing started with a group of victims trusting the Dutch for aid when they were in crisis. Kieft would get his in the end. I mean, recalled to answer for his deeds and journeying back to the Netherlands in 1647, he drowned. According to Light and Blue Sky Delgado, there was also an attack in the English colony of Connecticut at Stamford, where 700 people perished in a single day around the same time. If that's true, that's quite a killing spree. And there was one more massacre I want to highlight here as we wind down this portion of the overview of John Underhill's life. This event occurred on Long Island, today's Massapequa. Let's be honest, all the violence and the bloodshed was over the business of furs and wampum and the acquisition of land. The commerce is almost understandable in a way. You're talking about money. But the land is something altogether different. I mean, first of all, the Europeans and the natives had a very different understanding of land ownership. The natives did not have the concept of permanence that the Europeans did. This was a source of contention over and over and over again. I mean, frankly, you'd think the Europeans would have figured that out pretty quick. Maybe they did. Maybe they just played dumb. Maybe that dumbness played pretty well in their kangaroo courts that they ultimately subjected the natives to. But it didn't alleviate the real divide between the two. So it happened that there had been some confusion of this kind between the Dutch and the Marsa Piqua tribe. And I just know I'm going to mess this name up. Uh, Takapusha. Sorry if I got that wrong. If anybody knows. 
Der Sekum, Takapusha, claimed he had sold the Dutch the right to use the land. The Dutch claimed they owned it, meaning it was now theirs, meaning the natives had no say or claim to it. All of this is taking place just as John Underhill is killing his way across the entire region. Now, the confusion seems to have stemmed from a poor interpretation of the actual desires of the Dutch purchaser. There was no direct translation for purchase in that sense. So the deal that was struck had the interpreter offer to, quote, share hunting grounds, end quote. The Dutch wanted the land and they weren't going to give in on this. So Takapusha built a fort called Fort Neck for the protection of his people from the Dutch and from John Underhill. Again, another native story where the natives are actually accommodating the very people that appear to be the root of so much of their own problems. So John Underhill, at the direction of Director Kieft, attacked and burned the fort to the ground. I mean, are you seeing a pattern here? There were hundreds of casualties. The bodies were piled up in a single large mound. I mean, that smacks of a complete disregard that these were people. They had unique, singular identities, and now they're just a, a mound of corpses. The stench, the vermin, the sight. I mean, again, another massacre, and then another feast was had by the victors. By the time this was over, the Mohawk had joined the Dutch, and the Wappinger were devastated. They lost an estimated 1,500 warriors in the two years of the war. Between the years 1600 and 1659, the natives of this region saw their population drop by as much as 90%. I mean, you might not think 1,500 warriors is a lot, but for the way these population densities work, that was a significant amount of manpower. John Underhill was a successful tool in the hands of both the Dutch and the English when it came to eradicating the native problem. He was effective and ruthless, as we've demonstrated. He's a hero to the victors and a devil to the foe. In the end, the list of native victims of John Underhill is long. I'm not talking about the body count. We've seen that. In this instance, I'm referring to whole communities, separate, identifiable groups who lost everything to the actions of John Underhill. I want to read a list of some of the native groups that were affected, and I know I'm going to butcher some of these names, so I again apologize ahead of time. The groups that were affected by John Underhill were the Hackensack, the Haverstraw, the Muncie, the Navasink, the Raritan, the Tappan, the Wekwa Seageek, the Sinksik, the Kitchwank, the Notchpeam, the Siwani, the Tan Kaidik, the Wappinger, the Canarsi, the Manhattan, Rockaway, Mattencock, Massapequa, Sekatoeg, and Merrick. And again, if I butchered those names, I sure am sorry. But all of those people groups suffered irreparably at the hands of John Underhill. He lived in a tough day. He lived a tough life. And he had his rationale. The one thing, though, I will say is he owned his actions. He's quoted as saying this, quote, It may be demanded, why should you be so furious, as some have said? Should not Christians have more mercy and compassion? But I would refer you to David's war, when a people has grown to such a height of blood and sin against God and man and all confederates in the action, there he hath no respect to persons, but harrows them and saws them and puts them to the sword and the most terriblest death that may be. Sometimes the scripture declareth women and children must perish with their parents. Sometime the case alters, but we will not dispute it now. We had sufficient light from the word of God for our proceedings, end quote. It's an awful thing when people use the Bible or any holy book to justify absolute atrocities. And the thing is, think about that quote. This is from a guy with a wife and children. And we can debate the larger issues with, within colonialism and what people thought or what people did. But here in his own words, John Underhill speaks for himself. He indicts his own actions. His understanding was that extermination was the goal. And you can judge that however you want to. Well, this was quite a look into the life and times of John Underhill, wasn't it? I apologize if you think this was a depressing episode. We have to remember to see these guys in the world and the context in which they lived. We want to develop 
a real sense of, of what actually went on and how things went down. We didn't quite finish John Underhill today. There is more to the John Underhill saga, another whole chapter, actually. I mean, he enjoyed a second career in administrative assignments among the Dutch as well. He would once again turn his attentions towards respectable public service at the request of Peter Stuyvesant, who would replace William Kieft as director of New Netherlands. They would get along great until they didn't. Then Peter Stuyvesant would be on the receiving end of John Underhill. And his actions at that point in the storyline played an influential role in the founding liberties of our founding fathers delivered to us a hundred years after John Underhill would pass from the scene. It was a big deal, a big beneficial deal for us all. Oh, and then there was the coming Anglo-Dutch war as well. But those are stories for next time. Until then, I hope our time together today has really made the history come alive. Thanks for listening to History Comes Alive. We hope today's episode has given you valuable new information and inspired you to dive even deeper. Don't forget to check out Jeff's website, historywithjeff.com, and engage with Jeff across all your favorite social media platforms at History with Jeff. Join us next time as more history comes alive.